Mark Roth's research in suspended animation might require you to suspend disbelief. Certainly his work is the stuff of science fiction, inducing hibernation in trauma patients so that doctors can perform miracles. No wonder that even as the MacArthur Foundation calls him a genius, he's also listed in Ripley's Believe It or Not. And that's also why Mark Roth of the Fred Hutchinson Research Center joins our exclusive list of the innovators. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Well, Dr. Mark Roth, welcome. Hi, it's nice to be here. Um, you actually gave a TED Talk a couple of years ago, and, you, and the concluding words were this. You hope to make miracles a little more common. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, the work that I've been doing in the lab is generally surrounding survival limits, and I've been really uh, interested in the idea that some people, when they're exposed to difficult circumstances, such as near-death experiences, manage to survive, and others do not, and I'm very interested in extending those uh, survival limits and making miracles more common. I mean, it sounds like the stuff of science fiction. How on earth did you come up with the idea that this could actually be? Uh, well, it's a longer story, uh, but I was very interested in why people pass away and began to ask physicians that worked in uh, trauma centers around the city here in Seattle, uh, what do they write in the box where it says cause of death? And they tend to write that they didn't get enough oxygen uh, in the tissues, such as an essential organ, the brain or the heart, and that led to their dying. And so I began to think about what the response of animals is to reduce the oxygen. And I've seen you in talks that you've given referred to it as mice on ice or gorking. What, if, if we were to see you doing this research, what would it look like? Well, in general, because oxygen is so essential to life, comes from the atmosphere around us, uh, we spend a lot of time constructing atmospheres that are not like the one you and I are in now. And we look at the responses of animals to those atmospheres, and we found that we can control, uh, for instance, whether they're behaving as a mammal or behaving as a reptile. So what does it take? So you've got a, a, a mouse in your lab, and you want to, frankly, deanimate them. Mm -hmm. What do you need to do to change the conditions to make that happen? Well. Uh, one way to do it quite easily, the first way we did it, was actually to take, uh, to make air, which is typically having 20% oxygen and more or less all the rest is nitrogen, and we put in a very, very small amount of hydrogen sulfide in the air, and as the animal breathed that new kind of air that's different than one you and I are breathing now, then it became a reptile. What's so special about hydrogen sulfide? Uh, well, it, you know, it turns out that the appreciation of the interaction we have with oxygen is such that we use it like a candle uses oxygen to burn. And what I think we've missed is that we're not just burning so brightly that we have our candle burn out too soon. We're actually controlling our burn by producing these things that oppose burning. And one of those things we think is hydrogen sulfide, which you produce naturally in the cells of your own body. So what you're actually trying to create is you want that candle to go out for a little bit, but then come back to life. Well, I, I want to control the burn much like you control the degree to which the furnace burns in your house. When it's wintertime, you want it to burn brightly. When it's summertime, not so much. So you've referred to reptiles. So obviously reptiles know how to do this inherently. What happens when you actually turn that mouse into a reptile for a brief point of time? Uh, well, one of the things is that many of the vital signs that you typically um, want to preserve, particularly in uh, trauma situations such as heart rate, breathing rate, blood pressure, they all diminish. So it's almost like the, almost flatlining then? Uh, yeah. Huh. And so what is that, if, if, if this were to happen for humans, you actually were able to make this happen for humans, what does that actually allow you to do by doing that? Well, uh, so here is the way we think about it. Um, we think that when people have difficult uh, moments, such as uh, blunt trauma or a gunshot wound or something like that, what they have is they have a decrease in their demand, they have a decrease in their supply of oxygen, but their demand is high, and so they pass away. What we've learned to do is now decrease your demand for oxygen so that when supply falls, it's not a problem. 
It's supply and demand. It's, it's exactly. economics. <laughs> it is. It is. It's and absolutely economics. So what you're doing is you're fundamentally buying time for somebody in a critical situation. Right, right. You're decreasing their dependence upon that which they can't get, which in this case, because of a vascular injury and so on, is oxygen. Huh. Yeah. Um, and and would, once you've able to figure out how to make this happen, would the average medical professional be able to sort of create those circumstances to, to, to allow that? Yes, because we started out simply using um, gas hydrogen sulfide. It's very awkward to think about medical practitioners using gas in, in a first line of response in EMTs and such. But we learned how to make an intravenous formulation of the same thing, and you can just run it right into someone's vein, and you can have this agent the same way as you get it by breathing. Now, I understand that hydrogen sulfide is actually something that is inherent in our, like we actually have some hydrogen sulfide right, already? Right, right, and that's the thing that um, in the last 10 or 15 years, it has become apparent enigmatically that things like carbon monoxide, the leading cause of suicide, made in your own body, hydrogen sulfide, a very heinous toxin used as a chemical warfare agent, made in your own body. I mean, what's going on here? Why is it that we have all these previously described environmental heinous toxins in us, why are we making them? And I believe we're doing that because we don't want to have our candle burn out too fast. We're always regulating our burn by the production of these things that oppose burning. And how much did that play into the evolution of the human species, the fact that we actually have these inherently killer gases inside us? I would say it played a very critical role. You'll recognize, of course, that mammals and birds are at the top of the food chain, so that when the sun goes down and the reptiles get cold, the mammals maintain their core temperature and eat the reptiles, and we are at the top of the food chain. And I believe it's because we have an ability to internally control our metabolism, whereas the reptiles are dependent upon the environment and the sun being up. I mean, is it possible that if we actually really learn how to master this stuff that we could guarantee our immortality? I think that uh, we're a long ways from immortality. I think what we're trying to do here is to appreciate the inherent flexibility that we have. For example, I believe that it's, it's quite possible that people who meditate may harness these natural abilities just by thinking about it. And what we're doing is allowing people to, who don't have meditation uh, training to, if you will, experience a sort of meditative uh, moment at their time when they're most in need of not being excited. Well, that's really interesting. We're going to take a break right now, Mark, but when we get back, I want to talk a little bit more with you about how on earth you figure this out. So okay. we'll be right back with Mark Rod. We're back with Dr. Mark Roth from Fred Hutch. Mark, this is really amazing what you figured out, that there's this incredible balance of gases around us that allows us to live and regulate our oxygen. You know, a lot of people look at scientists such as yourself and say, it must be the eureka moment when the apple falls off the tree onto your head and it's like that. How on earth did you get to this understanding that this is how we operate as humans? Uh, well, I, there wasn't so much one eureka moment, but uh, if I was forced to talk about one uh, transition that occurred, it was, I was actually watching television. Uh, in 2003, and it was a television show about um, caves, and particularly Lechuguilla Cave in Mexico. And uh, the person who was describing the cave said to the person who was being taken into the cave, be careful, we have to put on these respirators before we go in, because there's natural emanations from the cave that have so much hydrogen sulfide that if you had one breath inside the cave, you would collapse. And that was, uh, uh, early October 2003, and uh, I immediately uh, ran upstairs, got on the internet, and started learning about the transient deanimation that people have experienced and continue to experience when they're exposed to too much hydrogen sulfide. It's called a knockdown. You actually take one breath over 1,000 ppm, and you deanimate, and then if you're brought back to fresh air, you just reanimate, and I thought, that's it. I'm going to get a tank of that gas because it's going to do it. How hard was it to get that gas? Well, as you know, 2003, post 9-11, it was a bit tedious. And I have had Homeland Security uh, come to my lab, and it's been great. They've been really helping us, along with um, city officials here in Seattle, to make sure that as we work with these agents, which do have powerful effects on physiology, and if they're not harnessed correctly, can really lead to adverse events. So uh, we've been uh, working uh, 
working well since then, and it's been great. I can imagine. I mean, this has been your life's work, and all of a sudden you're watching a television show. I mean, somebody might watch this show one day and do something yeah. as well. But um, what did that feel like? Was it, did you, were you almost certain when you saw that, oh, that is the answer to everything I've been trying to figure out? Uh, it was a transition for me, and as far as whether it's television or the internet or whatever it is, I've been, you know, I realize that for me innovation has been possible to a large extent because of the uh, huge amount of information that's available to everyone that wasn't true before, even when, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and so now it's here. So you couldn't have done this 10 no, years ago? No, you can become an expert on anything now. You just... You can. You all of it's on the internet. It's it's available to people. So Wait, it's wonderful. Do, do we need a PhD in a MacArthur grant to, to do this then? <laughs> no, no. I think it's open to everyone. I really think it's an opportunity in the world that just wasn't present ten years ago. You've used that word gorking when now that you've figured out that hydrogen sulfide actually allows this 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 thing to happen. What does that really mean to gork something? Well, it is a vernacular. It's true. Um, I think in a more um, jargony technical sense. It's, uh, it is when an animal decreases its burn, decreases its, uh, uh, when vital signs begin to diminish, we have a visceral response to creatures, people, when they start to let go of vital signs. We think they're dying. Um, they're not always. They're not. I mean, the first time that you actually applied this theory and saw it work or happen, mm -hmm. what, 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 what ran through your mind? Well, that uh, first that, that it wasn't true. <laughs> Actually, I uh, felt that it wasn't uh, that something we had done had led us to, to some artifact. So, so, you, so, so you you were, didn't believe it? No, no, no. In fact, uh, I should be clear. There's a certain video that I have that I that we caught actually on tape. But it's it's um, it's an animal that we're videotaping with a webcam, and the animal becomes deanimated. And literally, it's like near five o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm totally depressed. I think we've killed the animal. I'm sure we've killed the animal. And then, because uh, all the vital signs have gone, and we're watching it. And I said, well, we gotta go, that's it, we've killed it. And so then, we're literally taking everything apart and going home, and, and somebody says, hey, the thing's starting to move. And I was like, come on, you switched the animal, and you're just playing with me, or whatever. And, uh, and so it was quite a moment of disbelief, actually. You didn't know you had succeeded? No. In fact, I had thought that I had failed, pretty much confident that I failed. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and right away, we went right across the street and had a beer. All of us did. We did. <laughs> we yeah. celebrated, at least. We did. So we did. We're going to take another break. And what I want to talk about when we get back is about the consequences, even from a philosophical point of view, what it means to have this kind of immortality. So we'll be right back with Mark Roth. talking about sus suspended animation with Dr. Mark Roth. Uh, Mark, this is incredible stuff. Um, you know, there's also, to me, when we're talking about immortality and being able to induce this kind of suspended animation, there must be some spiritual questions as well. Uh, we certainly get the scientific process that went into doing this, but what on earth motivated you to go into something which, frankly, is a little bit scary sometimes? Yeah, people don't like to think about the process of dying and, uh, uh, um, it does, there are a lot of, you know, either religious, spiritual sort of overtones to it. And, you know, really um, the approach I've taken is to try to fractionate death like you would taking the parts out of a car. I really want to understand what are the transitions that um, living things make. And what I've found is that some of the transitions that we think as part of the process of dying are actually steps our body's taking to try and remain alive, but albeit uh, quietly meditating for some period of time when we're trying to heal. So I'm just trying to think of young Mark Roth as a kid, um, looking ahead and saying, this was my destiny. Oh. I mean, what, what, what pushed you in this direction? Well, I've, I've always been really curious about um, counterintuitive sorts of things, and particularly um, things that can be well documented. So we know there's curiosities in the world, things that are just, I can't explain them, ball lightning, um, uh, you know, near-death experiences and such. And, and so I've always been interested in counterintuitive things. So as I've had a chance then to be independent as a researcher, uh, it's just like that's the bug zapper for me. That's where I go. I'm going for the stuff that's bizarre, but yet, you know, not 
you know, it's, 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 it's clear it's happening. We just don't have any idea why. You need to have the scientific discipline and process to make this happen, but even as you saw it happen for the first time, how much did you think there was something a little more divine happening, you know, occurring that you were witnessing that might play into how you sort of process this? Well, I don't think the process per se of what we did is divine. I think it makes enormous amount of sense. The most important aspect to being alive is the way you transduce, and the way we as living things transduce energy from the sun, that is the diet, the food we take in, and the way that translates to the animation and movement, the chemical activities that we can engage in. And I really think that uh, um, looking back at it now, it makes perfect sense that you would regulate your burn. How could you not do that? Who wouldn't do that? Everybody's got to do that. And so we just found out how you do that. Probably. It seems so obvious now in hindsight, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem anything but that. And have your peers caught on to this and sort of recognize that this is now the new normal? Uh, well, uh, no. I mean, the notion of standard or basal metabolic rate from the time you're slapped on the butt until you take your last breath, and you can't go lower than that, that's a pretty hard and fast thing. And we're really challenging that. So I think in this period right now even, you don't see physiology books being written that there's this way to, if you will, engage aspects of hibernation and non-hibernating animals, that kind of thing. You don't see that. It's going to take a while. I think you've just, we're just now at the beginnings of wrestling with it. If we can use this technology to, if you will, improve outcome for humans in trauma, then you're going to see that field of dreams where that demonstration of value creation society is going to propel people to embrace it, and that's what we're aiming at. So how imminent is this in terms of human well, application? Well, I mean, uh, there have been human trials. There have been efforts. I'm not going to discuss them in detail, but I will say that uh, if you examine other technologies such as anesthesia and the way it came on and the way it's impacted society, it takes a while to wrestle to the ground, but as people embrace the utility that is clearly manifest, uh, they're going to put it to good use, just like they do with other things. Well, I think we're going to take another break, and when we come back, I want to talk a bit more about if we had to sort of look to the future once this stuff does take hold, how much will our lives change? We'll be right back with Mark Roth on Fort Beaks. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from the Museum of History and Industry and from Weber Shandwick. We're back with scientist Mark Roth. Mark, we talked about that you've actually just started doing human trials in this. I mean, once it does succeed and you actually know this is something that's safe, can be done on a regular basis, mm -hmm. how will our lives change? What does this look like? Well, in the beginning, it will be... Uh, not noticeable to almost anyone. There will be, if you will, an approved indication by the Food and Drug Administration for administration of this agent for some circumstance. And, uh, and so that, what, what, what it'll do is it'll, um, uh, it may be something like pulmonary hypertension, it may be something like blood loss, but it will be for something. And you'll gradually see physicians, once it's in the clinic, start to embrace the use of the agent for other indications. And it will appear, I think, to most people like a more fundamental way to think about anesthesia. It won't just be for pain and suffering in surgery. It's actually going to be there to improve your ability to get through the cardiac bypass surgery. Do you know what I mean? Yep. So it'll appear that way to most people, I think. So you've got somebody who's got a critical blood loss. The right. EMTs has picked them up on the ambulance. Yeah. What might actually happen at that point? Well, I mean, what will probably happen is they'll have an IV set up where the agent will be delivered intravenously, and the person will have an appearance of deanimating, or will, if you will, um, will dim the candle a bit. It may not even be such that vital signs are diminished that much further than they already are based on the trauma, but then the person will be brought in, and from the perspective of the patient, it'll appear as though they have had a sedative, or possibly they've engaged anesthesia pre you know, ahead of time. But it won't really be an anesthesia, an anesthetic the way we think about that. It'll be more of a fundamental change in your burn, which will provide you that capacity to get past the fact that your demand is high, but your supply is low. Let's lower your demand so that you can still stay above the, you know, below the supply you have. So this is amazing application for medical trauma. Obviously, scientists and science fiction writers are looking at this and saying, well, we've been writing and, and, and doing movies about this since Aliens and Prometheus and everything yeah. like that. Does this actually have applications for things such as space travel? 
Well, I think as we embrace the notion of metabolic flexibility that we all have and get past the notion that we're stopped by standard or basal metabolic rate and we can lower beyond that, I think we'll start to first use it for clinical indications, as I mentioned, but then as it becomes possible to become comfortable with the notion of being you know, partially animated or maybe fully deanimated for some length of time, I think we'll start to see other potential uses whatever they may be. It's not the fountain of youth. Like We can't extend our lives by deanimating every 20 minutes every day or anything. Well, actually, uh, what seems to be true is that when you deanimate creatures, they don't seem to have time. That is to say, if you were an animal is going to live for a week, but I deanimate it for half the time, now it lives to an observer for two weeks. So. There is a very curious thing that I think is going to come up, and it's not published yet, but I'm happy to say it here, that there is this ability to, if you will, think about whether time passes for a creature that's actually deanimated, and we don't think it does. Huh. So it really changes the discussion a bit that we've been having. That's remarkable. It's almost like we could substitute sleep for deanimation and all of a sudden extend our lives by 20 if we had to. Well, sl during sleep, you're actually having time. During deanimation, you're not. So it changes the nature of time in terms of how we experience it then. That gets to an issue of whether life creates time. And I think it's worth discussion, but I'm not sure whether we have time here. No, and you're right, you're right. We just <laughs> ran out of time. But I love this notion of a, of a human pause button, which is essentially what you've, you posited to us. So right. this is just remarkable work, Dr. Markloth. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, scientist, you're an entrepreneur as well from the Fred Hutch. Thank you very much for joining no, us. Thank you, and Hansen. we invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us at fourpeaks.org. I'm Hanson Hossein. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.